Good evening and welcome to q and I'm Tony Jones, here to answer your questions tonight. Senior Labor frontbencher Anthony Albanese. Independent candidate, likely member for Wentworth, Karen Phelps. Feminist author Anne Summers. New South Wales Liberal Party President, Philip Ruddock. And political commentator, Peter Van Onselen. Please welcome our panel. Thank you. Q&A is live in Eastern Australia on ABC TV, iView and News Radio. Over the weekend, the Morrison government faced its first electoral test. Our first question is on that. Obviously, it comes from Dan Berry. Uh, my question's for Mr Ruddick. Um, I'm a disillusioned Liberal voter that voted on Saturday for Dr Phelps in the Wentworth by-election. After losing what has previously been a safe Liberal seat for over 70 years, will the party finally address the toxic right-wing element that has hijacked the traditional values of the party and oppose the pre-selection of these right-wing members, such as Tony Abbott. Philip Ruddock. Well, let me first start by congratulating Karen Phelps. Uh, she ran a very, very vigorous campaign and it may possibly be successful for her and I acknowledge very much the campaign that she ran. You're expecting it to be successful by the sound of it? I am aware that it has been getting tighter um, but uh, the numbers are still, I think, fairly difficult to overcome. But... It's over. Um, well, <laughs> <laughs> you were the one that was holding out hope on Sunday. I, I, I noticed that. I wouldn't that. use the word hope, but <laughs> I was cautious. But uh, let me deal with the question as I may. Um, John Howard used to talk about the Liberal Party and the need for it to be a broad church. Um, I come from a particular perspective. Um, I like to think that I am a liberal, uh, not a conservative, but I recognise that it is important to have people with a broad spectrum of views in the political party if we're going to be able to govern. But you need to function as a team, um, and I would say very much, as far as the party is concerned, the effort has to be to ensure that they're all going to play on the wicket together. What happens... Uh when, Philip, when too many of the Conservatives decide who sits in the pews? Well, let me, let me just say I am of the view that the party should always select the best candidate. And uh, I would make this point about what happened in Wentworth. Um, uh, we would have had uh, in Dave Sharma, I think, an outstanding Member of Parliament. He came through a process which is as I want to see the process. That is that the party has a wide field of candidates from whom to choose and people make their judgment on the day on who they believe can be the best member of parliament. But I do want to make one other observation. Um, you should not make assumptions about particular outcomes um, and suggest that that's where it will end up. When I first stood, for public life in 1973, I had a margin of something like 10,000 votes. There was an election, you may or may not remember, in 1974, it was the first uh, Whitlam double dissolution. And I only held my seat then by 1,300 votes, six months later. The changes that can occur in relation to by-elections are always very significant. And one ought not to assume that because you lose, um, that you can't claw it back. OK. Peter Van Onsel. Look, I, I think the problem, to answer the question, uh, with the right wing of the Liberal Party is that it calls itself conservative now when it no longer is. Uh, I call them reactionaries because true conservatives are protectors of institutions and they're very incremental about change without opposing change per se. Whereas the so-called conservatives, which I don't think actually fit the title now, they're not protecting institutions, they're prepared to blow them up. For example, the institution of Prime Minister. Uh, and equally, they're not open to incremental change even, but they're reacting to the sort of policy shifts that they see as either popular with their base uh, or populist in a way that they can utilise in a sort of electoral sense. So I think that's the real problem with the right wing of the Liberal Party. I like the concept of the balance between conservatism and liberalism in the Liberal Party, but I don't think that the isms are being represented by the people in Parliament or indeed by the power brokers that now control those sections. Karen Phelps, uh, what do you think, and by the way, do you think that the question is on to a point that helped you 
come very close to, if not win, this seat? Well, I've been on the ground in Wentworth for the last four or five weeks, talking to people who are considering their vote in this Wentworth by-election. And there's no question that there was a lot of anger and frustration with the direction the Liberal Party has been taking. They don't like the lurch to the right. They wanted to see uh, a candidate who was going to uh, bring the electorate back to the sensible centre, if you like, and, uh, and more generally the Liberal Party back to the sensible centre. Uh, they wanted more socially progressive policies and they weren't hearing that from the Federal Liberal Party. All they were hearing about was the factional infighting within the Liberal Party and self-interest and not about the interest of the Australian people. And that's one of the things that they were reacting to. Now, we've got another question on this from Carolina Murdoch before I bring in the other panellists. Let's get her question, Carolina. Um, it's long been argued that the left side of politics self-destructs as a result of ideological divisions. So are we now looking at this happening to the right? Anthony Albanese. Well, I think the problem with the uh, right wing of the Liberal Party at the moment is that they're, they're frightened of the present and what modern Australia is, but they're terrified of the future. So they're not able to uh, foreshadow a path to that future. It's all about looking backwards. And uh, they ha actually had this, some talk about Malcolm Turnbull's contribution or non-contribution in Wentworth. I mean, on Friday night, the Bellevue Hill branch of the Liberal Party there in the heartland of Wentworth held a forum with Tony Abbott, Craig Kelly, Andrew Hastie, all these right-wing warriors to talk about resisting the left in Australia instead of campaigning on the by-election. I, mean, I just found it absolutely extraordinary. And I, I think within the Labor Party, of course, there are, there are factions in the Labor Party, uh, but there's a consensus about a general direction forward. Uh, within the Liberal Party, there are people who argue that Malcolm Turnbull, caucus colleagues, Malcolm Turnbull wasn't a legitimate Liberal. He was a, a, a socialist who entered into the Liberal Party and somehow took it over. And, and that's why they've got a fundamental problem. And that's why what we could be seeing is the early stages of an absolute schism on the right of Australian politics. Um, can I just make one point? That is, if it were not for the uh, factional system in the Labor Party, you'd be the leader, wouldn't you? Well, <laughs> we, have, uh, we have a system that does provide some order, but we also have a system whereby uh, we give all the rank-and-file members of the party a vote. We engage... Most people in the Labor Party aren't members of factions. Uh, but there's a, there's a consensus about the big issues. We're, we're not arguing about whether climate change exists or not. We're not arguing about whether we need to move to equality, whether it be on the basis of gender or sexuality or race or religion. OK, Anthony, Those uh, arguments uh, that, was, that was an invitation to, uh, to <laughs> the stump speech. Well, why not? <laughs> it, was, it, was a, it was a question that you definitely avoided. Um, Anne Summers. I think the um, Liberal Party might as well change its name to the Lemmings Party because, you know, they are <laughs> headed over a cliff big time and there's nothing going to stop it. I mean, the, the thought that there could be any reconciliation between what the one remaining Liberal left in the party and, and the Conservatives, so-called Conservatives, I agree with Peter, they are actually uh, reactionaries probably even to... The one remaining. ..kind of word. Uh, yourself? I'm, I don't accept that. <laughs> I don't accept that. Well, they're very few, very hard, very uh, few, and far behind, far between, very hard to find. I mean, I think the biggest problem in Wentworth uh, was the failure to elect a woman candidate, and to say that the candidate who was elected is a great guy, I'm sure he is. But the point is that a party which has a very low percentage of women candidates, which is going to decline dramatically after the next election, to forego the opportunity in this seat uh, to not... Ch and there were three women candidates they could have chosen from. Um, I mean, Karen might not be as happy tonight if they'd done that. In fact, you might not even have run if, if they'd chosen a good woman candidate. But it was just such an obvious thing for them to have done. Why didn't they do it? And well, it can we... Can we uh, Philip's the state president, so could you not find a woman qualified enough to, to take that position? Look, I don't want to reflect upon the quality of candidates. Um, I but will that's only... the question. That's no, what you're being no, asked. Well, <laughs> no, let me, let me be very clear that in relation to these matters, I am keen to see as large a field as possible from whom to choose. And what happened in Wentworth was we had a field that was very, very strong. Um, and it finished. 
uh, on the basis of the way in which each of the candidates presented themselves and spoke. And it's regrettable that the women candidates in that situation were not able to contribute in the same way that Philip, Dave Sharp. is it Sharp true that the first woman under consideration came fourth in the ballot? It, well, I mean, it is true that the first four were men. Um, so fifth, and, and, actually. And that's right. So the first woman came fifth in the ballot. And, and uh, all I can say is that I am one who, in Australia, appointed women to the High Court of Australia, probably more women than any other Attorney General. But how are you going to appoint and, more women to Parliament? And, and, and I make the point that you need to have people with the skills and talents prepared to present themselves, and we as a party need to be out there seeking them and encouraging them. Peter wants to jump in here. Obviously, keep it short because we've got other questions. Th things, I think, are so bad in terms of gender for the Liberal Party now that they need something to get women to want to present themselves. And like it or not, even if it's short term, that's a quota system now. Now, Liberals constantly say, we don't support quotas on philosophical grounds. Well, you've got a quota for the number of nationals in Cabinet in your coalition agreement. You looked at quotas for male primary school teachers during the Howard years, as you'd well know, as an option. <laughs> you've got a quota for the factional makeup of the front bench. You've got a quota for the Senate per state. There's quotas for everything, but suddenly when it's about gender, we philosophically oppose quotas. OK. That's the problem. We're going to come back to that question later. Um, the next question is from Isabella Bogue-Taylor. Anthony Albanese, considering the way Alex Turnbull, son of Malcolm, was able to mobilise voters to denounce the Liberal Party in Wentworth, should the Labor Party invite him to run as a Labor candidate in a <laughs> federal election? Uh, no. And, <laughs> and, and, and I don't think, uh, with respect to Alex Turnbull's intervention, uh, I, I've never seen anything suggesting from him that he was a supporter of the Labor Party. He supported Kerrin in this, uh, this by-election, and that's not surprising, given the way that uh, his father was treated. Were you surprised that Alex was, in fact, the only member of the Turnbull family, including his father, the former Prime Minister, to express um, a strong opinion about who should win that seat? Well, I, I was not surprised that uh, Malcolm Turnbull felt as though he had been... <laughs> Uh, badly treated by his party. Um, we had circumstances whereby, from his perspective, he thought he was in a winning position. That's arguable. Uh, but certainly, he was competitive. And the idea that, uh, that Peter Dutton was the answer was pretty bizarre, I think. <laughs> yes, and, uh, right. and, and Scott Morrison came through and became Prime Minister with half a dozen supporters, that's all, in the caucus. Can I be mischievous? Um, I must say I thought Alex was a friend of the Labor ca candidate and, in fact, advocated for the Labor candidate. That was my thought. And um, until the Labor candidate was essentially running dead, um, you know, he was out there advocating for him as a friend, okay, I thought. Let, let's go as back. Friend, I just want to, not I want to hear what uh, Karen Phelps is, um, thinks about this because um, the idea that the Liberal MPs are stating it today, or a number of them, is that if Malcolm Turnbull had expressed his direct support for Sharma, he would have beaten you. Look, I don't want to get too deeply into the analytics. I've been focusing on the issues that are important to the people in Wentworth and to the people of Australia. And we've got a, a, a bright future ahead of us as Australians if we get this right. And, uh, you know, there were issues of such monumental importance to our future, like action on climate change, mm. uh, the treatment of asylum seekers, the future of the ABC, a National Integrity Commission. These are the issues that people actually really wanted to talk no, we're about. Gonna, we're going to talk about them, but we're looking mm. at the entrails just for a minute. Um, <laughs> <laughs> do you think it would have made a difference if Turnbull had supported Sharma? I don't, I don't know. I, I can't really say. I mean, uh, there was a lot of anger about the way Malcolm uh, Turnbull was treated. He was a popular local member. Uh, there are a lot of people who are very disturbed about the way that he was removed, and, uh, and that was certainly a big factor. Whether he'd come back in and said, all is forgiven, everything's fine, uh, I think that's just fantasy. Yeah, Philip Ruddick, and, uh, your national president, uh, Nick Greiner, uh, of the Liberal Party, said that uh, Turnbull was being precious and that had he even sent out a tweet supporting Sharma, that Sharma might well have won. Do you agree with that? 
Look, I don't have a judgment in relation to whether he would or would not have been able to influence the matter. My, my view is that uh, he, uh, he has to make his own judgment as to what he thinks was appropriate in all the circumstances. The only comment I would make is that I think we do in Australia treat former prime ministers appallingly. Um, and uh, I look at... Prime Ministers appallingly, I, so you can start... Former, <laughs> former Prime Ministers appallingly. Yes, that's why we've um, got and, so many um, former. And, <laughs> no, let me, let me be very clear that uh, if you go to the United Kingdom, um, you know, if they're not in the House of Commons for years afterwards, um, they're elevated to the House of Lords. Um, and I think they are respected, but they have to be prepared to behave in a way which is positive and constructive... Um, and I think what has happened in Australia is that the Prime Ministers um, have essentially moved on um, and I think that's very unfortunate because I think they can contribute very positively if they're minded to do so. I was thinking of Lord Malcolm of Point Piper, but I'm not sure that that would satisfy him. <laughs> Peter Van Onselen, um, the, the backlash from at least some sections of the Liberal Party today was pretty profound and you spoke against it. Yeah, look, I, I don't think Malcolm Turnbull can win. I think if he, he, he doesn't campaign and he gets accused of, of therefore being, you know, somebody that costs them the seat, if he does campaign, he probably gets accused of being a distraction uh, and he probably would become a distraction to some extent. He gets accused of being a bad campaigner, that's why he had to go as Prime Minister, but suddenly they needed him in the seat of Wentworth. I, I think he could have made a difference. I don't blame him for not engaging after the way he was tweeted, uh, treated, I should say, but, uh, but, but there's a lot of things that led to them losing that seat. Maybe he could have saved it. Maybe if they hadn't supported Pauline Hanson's it's okay to be white motion. Maybe if the Jerusalem play hadn't happened, maybe if a whole series of things had changed, selecting a woman, selecting somebody from the area, as good a candidate as Dave Sharma is for politics, he wasn't from the area. All of these were factors. So you can't just drop it on Malcolm Turnbull. And what do you think? Well, you kick a guy out of a job um, because you don't like him and you say he's not even a Liberal and then you cry because he hasn't come and helped you save a seat that you took away from him. I mean, this is kindergarten stuff. Mm. Mm. And this is, this is symptomatic of what is wrong with the Liberal Party and the fact that they can't uh, seem to understand that and they articulate these absurd um, justifications uh, for what's gone wrong is, is... I mean, I don't think they realise how much people are just laughing at them. Let's move on. Uh, next question is from Sad. Peter Frolick. Sad, really. Peter. Peter Van Onselen has suggested that as a result of the Wentworth by-election that the government has lost the right to govern. And I understand his point. But equally, should an independent candidate such as Dr Phelps, congratulations, who gained just 29% of the primary vote and has secured a victory with a margin of just 1,650 votes in an electorate that numbers about 100,000, and in a by-election at that, be entitled to promote an agenda that is in conflict in so many areas with the policies of the government that won its majority at a general election. And put slightly differently, does a margin of just 1,650 votes entitle an independent to potentially hold an elected government, even a narcissistic government, to ransom? Karen. My view is that the role of an independent on the crossbench is not to hold the government to ransom, it's to hold the government to account. And I think it's very important at this time when the government appears to be not only in confusion but in utter chaos, if you look at the last couple of weeks, that we do have a stabilising effect of the crossbenchers who are able to uh, look at legislation and modify it where, where necessary, uh, to reject bad legislation, to negotiate with government for better outcomes for the Australian people. Because at the moment we have a government that, uh, for example, with the it's OK to be white Senator Hanson motion last week, uh, we had the Liberal senators voting for that motion, apparently unaware they were voting for something that was using slogans from the white supremacist movement in the United States, and then the next day saying, oops, we didn't mean to do that, uh, and, and let, let's have another go at it because we didn't read the motion and didn't understand what we were voting on. Now, that is just poor governance. And that's not the way to govern a country. So, you know, the crossbench uh, with strong local independents and minor party uh, members can actually get to, uh, to speak to the government about their concerns and indicate why they are voting against 
a particular piece of legislation, but at least to interrogate it with some intellectual rigour and to be actually knowing what you're voting on and knowing what you're debating. So I, I think there is now a very strong role for independence and we are seeing a move towards independence in other parts of the world as well. And, uh, and th this may well be the dawn of a new era rather than an anomaly. Quick question, if you work closely with a crossbench, do you believe you can force real policy change? That's about the, your agenda as opposed to the government's, as the questioner is asking. Yes, I think, you know, a lot has been said about the uh, balance of power, but I think actually the, the real issue here is uh, the power of balance. And I think that a good, st solid crossbench uh, with strong local representation can actually provide that, uh, that uh, balance that, that I think the debate needs and the nuance that the debate means, rather than sort of, you know, there's this view from this tribe and there's this view from this tribe, but where's the middle ground? Where's the sensible centre? And, uh, and that's what I would seek to bring to the crossbench, is right. that sensible centre. Let's test you on a couple of actual policies. Now, remember, if you hear any doubtful claims on Q&A, let us know on Twitter. Uh, keep an eye on the RMIT ABC Fact Check and the website, and the conversation website, I should say, for the results. The next question is from Melanie Saunders. Um, my question's for you, Karen. Um, you've said that you are ashamed of the policy of offshore detention and that as a doctor and a human being, it offends you. Could you please describe exactly how you will work to support an immediate end to offshore detention? Just before we came on set tonight, I heard the news that 16 uh, very ill... Sorry, I, I need to correct that. It's now, and the, the border forces corrected this, it's now 11 children have been uh, brought back to Australia, not 16, sorry. That's 11 children who've been rescued from appalling circumstances. And I believe we can thank the voters of Wentworth for that result because it has been front and centre in the debate. There have been refugee uh, forums within the electorate of Wentworth over the last few weeks and I've spoken at, at those forums. A lot of people at the polling booths have approached me about it and, uh, and indicated that. Uh, they are very concerned about it. I've spoken with refugee advocates and, uh, and I believe that we do need to bring an end to offshore detention. I think it's cruel and unusual punishment. I don't think it, it sits, sits, sits uh, well with the Australian con consciousness. And, uh, and I think that it, it is time that it is brought to an end. Now, we need to bring all of the children and their families, not just the very sick children. We don't wait till there's an emergency, but all of the, sick, all of the children and their families to Australia for urgent medical, psychological and, and community treatment. I mean, we, we need to have children who are growing up in a, a normal community environment with appropriate social supports and keeping those families together. Uh, I think we also, also need to look at, uh, at the options that are on the table uh, for uh, resettlement options. And, and the New Zealand option is, I think, uh, a very good interim measure at least. OK, can I, but just, just to get back to the question, I think, is there something that you could do with the crossbench? Would you, for example, support a no-confidence motion on this issue if it came up, if the government had not moved to remove all the... Uh, refugee or and asylum seeker children. There are 52 still on Nauru. Uh, there are 107 families still there. The border force figures from tonight. Um, would you be prepared to use what power you have in the balance of power uh, to do something on this issue? Look, I think the most important thing is that uh, we give now the government an opportunity to respond to what the people have said. The people have spoken on this issue, I believe, in this by-election. But is there a subtle threat behind that, that there could be support of a no-confidence motion if that didn't happen? I'd rather work by encouragement. I think the government will be encouraged to take action as they have done today. And with an election looming in May of next year, uh, it, the government will be judged on its response to this. And, and I don't think it will take a motion of no confidence to have them act on this. Uh, I, I think that the writing's on the wall with this particular issue. OK, we've got another question on this before I bring in the other panellists. It's uh, from Yusra Metwali. Prime Minister Scott Morrison, architect of the Stop the Boats policy, gave an emotionally charged yet overdue apology today to victims and survivors of institutional child sexual abuse apologising for their stolen childhoods. He received a telling reaction from Baruz Bachani, an award-winning journalist incarcerated in Manus Island. But Baruz pointed to the paradox of apologising for institutional child abuse occurring in Australia, while enabling <clears throat> abuse to occur to children 
under the watch of the Australian government in offshore detention? When will politicians extend their concern to the safety of refugee children living in Australian institutions offshore? Philip Ruddock. Well, let me make it very clear. I don't think children should be abused anywhere, any time. But I tell you, there are millions of children around the world in some of the most appalling circumstances that you could imagine. I thought I should at least ask the question, how many of you have been to Cox's Bazaar? Do you know Cox's Bazaar? One million people removed from Burma into Bangladesh. I was there several weeks ago. They are in the most appalling circumstances. One million. Most of them women and children. 65 million displaced people around the world. 22 and a half million who are refugees. I think we should be able to help those who need help most. I think there needs to be a focus on getting resolution so that these situations can be resolved. I want to see a situation where people are able to go back home and rebuild their lives in safety and dignity. I don't hear the efforts in relation to that. I hear the efforts in relation to the few. Let me say, I understand, and I only get it from newspapers, I was reading a Peter Harcher piece over the weekend in which he suggested that most of the children were shortly to be removed from Nauru to the United States of America under the arrangements that we have. Now, that may be right, it may be wrong, but I gather that they are talking about that. People want to get it resolved. When I'd been minister and we had offshore detention, most of the people had been removed at that time before the Howard government lost office. And I have to say... So doesn't that principle still hold here? You need and to work at it. Yes, the you do. The 53 children you're talking about, some of whom have serious mental illness or signs of it, according to the doctors that are treating them, have been there for a very long time, up to five years. Um, would you have allowed that to happen? In, you know, you're, you were the immigration minister. It was mm -hmm. a tough policy. Mm -hmm. Would you have allowed children to remain on Nauru for five years? No, let me just make the point. No, that's a, just, think, a, just a quick question for no, you. No, I think you need to deal with these things in a way that does not bring to the attention of those who are intent on abusing the system that you will eventually get what you want if you keep the pressure on. And it is, in my view, a matter that you have to deal with a great deal of delicacy. You don't abuse people. But I don't think you can be seen to so be these children, allowing... These children yourself. are said to be suffering from resignation syndrome. That is to say, they no longer believe they have any hope of leaving the island. So they're resigned to it and they're suffering as a result. Is that, does that concern you at all? I mean, you, we've heard your concern well, about the no, million I am, refugees. I am concerned What about the few about, that Australia has I am, responsibility for? I am for? always concerned to deal with them as humanely as possible in all the circumstances. But I have to say that what happened last time is that we had nobody in detention. And within a short period of time, we had 50,000 people turn up on boats in 18 months. OK. I'm, I'm you've got to be careful it. about what you wish for, Tony. Philip, I'm, go I'm going, um, to, I'm, and I'm when going to allow the other panellists to respond to it as well. I, I mean, those are well-rehearsed arguments. I, no, they're not. They're what I believe. No, I've spent most of my time in public life focusing on refugees. I've been to all the camps in the well, Middle East. Well known I've been around Africa. And we've heard them before, is what I'm saying. They, Peter no, they, need, to, they need to be emphasised over and over again, in my view. I, okay. I wrote about this when doing John Howard's biography, the as harsh as Howard's policies were, uh, which you were at the heart of, Philip, uh, they were nothing like this government's policies in the sense that your government, or John Howard's government, didn't leave people there indefinitely. You quietly moved them on when the spotlight wasn't on them so that it wouldn't lead to, in your view, further boats coming because of some sort of incentive for further boats to arrive. What this government has done is just left them there as a sort of form of reverse bait, a disincentive for other boats to arrive. And rather than take the opportunities that they have had for years to get them better health care, to get them out of this indefinite detention, they were left there. And by leaving them there, now the spotlight's on it. So now they're worried if you get them off, it becomes an incentive for boat arrivals. Well, that's their fault. 
because they didn't do what you did and get them off earlier when there wasn't a spotlight on it. Anthony Albanese, where's Labor on this? We can protect our borders without losing our national soul. And when you have kids left for five years who are suffering from mental health issues, who, are, who doctors are telling us they need assistance, we need to listen to that medical advice. We need to take action and get those kids the care that they need. And the argument about knocking back New Zealand, I mean, you would think the United States was a third world country. We are settling people in the United States. There is no reason whatsoever why the same arrangements that are there for the United States can't be there for New Zealand. And that means the figure that New Zealand have said under Prime Minister Ardern and under her predecessor as well, uh, Bill English and John Key from the Conservatives all said they would take a proportion of people every year that's greater than the number of, uh, of children that you just mentioned. So there are, it is possible to resolve this. Uh, the fact is that the people who arrived on the Tampa and I disagree with some of what occurred there. We won't get into all those debates, but they were settled here. There are people here now who arrived on the Tampa. Uh, just a quick question for you, and it's the obvious one, really. Would a Labor government ever detain children in offshore detention centres again? Well, what a Labor government would do is ensure... We, we aim to ensure that you stop the boats. No, is that it? That's really... Well, well, you could, should be no, able to no. answer that by a yes or a no. No, no, detain, that's not right, because you're assuming, you're assuming that it doesn't work. That's the assumption, so, that you've got kids well, let's in a, detention. Let's assume, well, I'm not let's assuming that. Let's, I'm assuming... Let's assume that you believe it works. I'm, I'm assuming that you... Would you continue you, to do it in government? Well, there wouldn't be any, Tony. That's the point. I think you can have strong border protection without, without having the step that this government has done, which is to perhaps... It's either conscious or due to incompetence, leave people there beyond any reasonable frame when it could have been sorted out. You can't tell me that a nation like Australia... And I'll say the other thing about what we would do. Because we would have regional processing, because we would fund the UNHCR properly, because we would double the numbers, we would be in a position to have much stronger negotiations with our neighbours and other countries in the region as well. Uh, yes, quickly, Karen, because I want to go to Anne Summers. As it turns out, when Philip Ruddock was the Immigration Minister, I was the president of the AMA. And I went along to have a discussion with, with Mr Ruddock and uh, there were hundreds of children in detention here in Australia and I argued for them to be released at the time and it took uh, a coalition of medical and psychological professionals to force that issue at the time. The medical profession now has risen up again and said this is unacceptable to have these children in detention on Nauru and it must end. And, uh, and I believe that that leadership from the medical profession is something that will be ultimately central uh, to, to a resolution of this. Yeah, yeah. But we need to engage with Asia as well because the conditions for, for people who are uh, refugees in Malaysia and Thailand and, and, uh, and other countries in the region are also intolerable. They don't have legal rights, they don't have support, they don't have work. And so Australia could engage with Asia to negotiate improved conditions for people so they didn't feel the need to try and escape from those countries. And the third thing that we can do is to stop punishing asylum seekers who are living here in Australia by removing the benefits that they have at the moment to help them with support. It's been removed from 1,500 people already. There are another 6,500 people who are going to have their uh, support payments removed from them, and we don't know how those people are going to survive. So this is a mess. Our refugee and asylum seeker policy must be re reviewed, and it must return to a humane and, and reasonable approach to the treatment of these human beings. Anne Summers. Well, I mean, <coughs> what, <coughs> excuse me, what, <coughs> what strikes me about this, uh, as you know, I've been living out of Australia for, for quite a few months now, so I've been observing this from afar and talking to people who come through New York, where I am at the moment, from Australia, who are expressing their frustration and their anger and their uh, sorrow and, and grief about what is happening. And... It seems to me that what, given what Philip has just said, that the government is refusing to actually engage with people. Isn't it? It's refusing to to recognise 
the anger and the frustration that many, many Australians feel. I know it's a very, very divisive issue and not everybody is um, convinced that we should be uh, bringing everybody back from these, uh, from Mount Manus Island and, and Nauru, but enough people feel that way that they should be treated seriously. And I think the expression of that view is obviously was evident in Wentworth and you, you will be, if you're elected, uh, very entitled to represent that view, uh, knowing that it's, you know, it's a highly contested area of politics. But what the thing about this government is it's refusing to engage mm. in legitimate recognition um, of the fact that so many Australians feel so strongly about this issue and are not willing to do anything about it. And so this is this, another example of apparent contempt that the government has for significant portions of the electorate. Uh, Philip, I'm going to give you a chance to respond because I feel I may have cut you off too early before. The only point I wanted to make in relation to Anthony's comments is that I hope his colleagues will support the measure to legislate to ensure that if people are sent to New Zealand, that they cannot avail themselves of the New Zealand concession where body who is a New Zealander wanting to access Australia can do so essentially without a visa, without any questions. Let, let's Just, get a quick, let's get a quick a answer on that. Good, good point. It ought to be moved. Um, Anthony Albanese, would the Labor Party support a situation where if those people went to New Zealand, they could never come to Australia let's, in their lives? Let's be clear of what's happened here. The government introduced that legislation. It sat in the Senate for two years. There hasn't been a, a minute of debate on it. Uh, when it comes to the US, the US is an attractive nation to go to for many people and uh, they were able to negotiate out uh, provisions with the United States. Uh, I see no reason why they couldn't negotiate out sensible solutions with New Zealand and uh, we've been calling for that for a long period of okay, time. Very, very briefly, would you agree with the Labor Party? Well, I'm not going to give Philip to... Ruddick a, a or, or you for that matter, a, a blank check on our migration policy. What I'll not say is... a blank is... check, it's just a question as to whether you'd agree to that one well, thing. Well, what's the one thing? <laughs> that you would what's stop those thing? people ever coming to Australia if they went to New Zealand? What if they want to come on a tourist visa? What if they want to... These things there, aren't there that are no simple. Tourists. There are no tourist visas required. If you're a New these Zealander, things, you just these come. Thing, these things aren't that simple, but we, would, we are prepared to consider any reasonable arrangement our priority is getting these kids okay. looked after. Well, right. I hope we can deal is with that a reasonable arrangement? Well, there, there are a whole range of provisions. It's not that simple, Tony, and you know it's not that simple, and Philip certainly knows. So you're prepared to sit down with the government and negotiate we, we, this ha issue. we have said that most importantly. The government has to sit down with the New Zealand government. All right. Tony, why, with why, the New why Zealand can't government. they come here? They could hang out with the Tampa refugees that are now here, that you let come <laughs> <laughs> All the, I don't understand. All, right. all, all the 400 people who, who were on Manus and Nauru who are here now. That's okay. the truth. All right, let's move to another big issue. The next question comes from Becca Emder. While the swing against the Liberals in Wentworth undoubtedly reflected widespread anger about the treatment of Malcolm Turnbull, it was also clearly an indictment of the Liberal Party's failures to take real action on climate change. However, on Sunday, Treasurer Frydenberg ruled out any change to the Coalition's climate policy. How can the Liberal Party justify this position, given this clear signal from the public that your inaction is no longer acceptable to the Australian people? Uh, Peter, I'll start with you for, for some analysis, because the Australia Institute conducted an exit poll which indicated climate change was a huge factor in the Wentworth by-election. Yeah, I, I don't doubt that it was an issue in the Wentworth by-election, and uh, the Lowy Institute has done its own poll around the nation showing that climate change is one of the issues that concerns most Australians. The concern that Liberals have, rightly or wrongly, is that they believe that you buttress climate change issues with power prices and they think that that matters in their key marginals, particularly outer metropolitan and, and regional marginal seats which take in uh, emission producing industries which employ people. So they conflate all of that. Where I disagree with them about that in a sort of political analysis sense is that climate change denial is not something that most Australians hold the view to, certainly most scientists don't. It's a small group of Liberal MPs, uh, an even smaller group of nationals, and then a, a very small group of right-wing commentators that run those lines. Now, I don't think that the science supports it from what I can see, and I don't think the wider public does. 
and if you burrow a bit deeper, it gets past the sort of argument that gets used why they have to go in that direction. This is a classic example of what I'm talking about, about that right wing of the party not being conservative. A conservative would want to take prudent conservative action at the same time as doing other things. Now, uh, those that don't support climate change just want no action or next to no action. And, and I just think that that is an ideological agenda that's not representative of the wider populace. I don't think it's even representative of the wider liberal base or the liberal voting base uh, for that matter as well. So I, I think that they're wrong about this and I don't, I don't really see why they can't change it other than the fact that there's a few Liberals that are prepared to throw their weight around that hold that view. OK, uh, Karen Phelps, first of all, how big an issue was it, do you believe? Uh, because that polling indicates one of the key issues. Um, and secondly, what do you intend to do about it? Well, there's absolutely no question that uh, climate change action was a major issue at the Wentworth by-election. It was something that almost everybody was talking about. You uh, couldn't miss the presence of climate change activists in the area, and they were engaging with people in, in a, a very real and fundamental way. And, uh, and, and it, it became one of the biggest issues, and we certainly now know that, that, that it was. Uh, what we need to do is, is accept the science on climate change. Climate change is real and uh, I'm science trained and, and I've you know, been satisfied by the evidence for a very long time. Uh, again, harking back to when I was AMA president, uh, I uh, asked the AMA to develop a policy on climate change and human health because we do know that human health is one of the great things that will suffer. Uh, when, uh, the when we fail to act on climate change. And Australia has the potential to actually be a leader in this area. And again, as an independent crossbencher, you, you can actually help to direct the debate um, by gathering expert evidence, by talking about the, the case, by making sure that you, uh, you make the case in a rational way, by putting forward uh, an action plan, as I did during the, the, uh, the campaign. And, Good and luck by with Bob about Catter, solutions. by the way, um, <laughs> since you'll need his support on the crossbench. Well, talk Can you imagine getting him into a room and convincing him that the science is real? The first thing you have to do politically is, and we, again, I hark back to the fact that we have a general federal election coming up in, in May of 2019, and that's not very far away. And if the uh, Liberal Party continues along this path of no action plan for climate change, then they will be judged again at the federal election. Do you, think do, you Australian... think do you think they'll last that long? Um, it's a key question for a crossbencher <laughs> and a new one. Um, do you think there'll be an early election? It's hard to say. I mean, I've, I've said all along that I think government should serve their full terms. I think three years is short enough. And, uh, and I, I believe that government should have the opportunity to, to serve that full term. So it would not be my intention uh, to, to trigger anything uh, like a general election sooner than that. But I would like to uh, trigger some action by the government to, to put together an actual action plan. Because, I mean, just for one thing, the investment community needs to have some security around government policy on re renewable energy, uh, to be able to invest money into, into technology development so that we can uh, have renewable energies that not only provide the power that we need, but can replace old fossil fuel technologies okay. as time goes by. Okay, and I've got to ask Anthony Albanese, is this part of the reason that Labor sort of backed Karen Phelps into this position? Well, we, uh, we had our own candidate. Mm. Uh, <laughs> You'd uh, hardly know. A, a very good candidate, Tim wasn't, Murray. Wasn't, he, what is, wasn't his job just to give preferences to Karen Phelps? No, no. He, he, his job... You, you do him a disservice, Tony. You Tim do. Murray was a very, very good candidate uh, I think uh, he I'm, will I'm make just a talking in pure political terms. As well. mm. in, in pure political terms, the chances of Labor winning Wentworth were were pretty. Uh, you'd have to be a great optimist. So you didn't run to dead. To think that that was you the didn't case. run dead. No, no. It's just that there aren't 50% plus one of people in the electorate of Wentworth want to elect a Labor member of parliament. OK, let, let's, let, let's go back to the, <laughs> to the question about climate, climate change. change. So here's the thing. There were, uh, the, um, the Australia Institute's um, exit polling had 100 and, sorry, 1,049 respondents. 78% said climate change had some influence on their vote. 49% said it had a lot of influence. 33% said it was the main issue. Yeah, I, I don't doubt that. Uh, because climate change is such a critical issue, particularly in one of the things about an electorate like Wentworth is that a lot of people aren't voting out of hip pocket 
issues. They don't need the state to provide them with income. Uh, they're prepared to vote on mm. values. And their, their values are, uh, are that they care about their kids and their future kids. They care about the Great Barrier Reef. They care about the natural environment. And climate change is a, an enormous challenge and it's something that they also know. Uh, and, and here we come to the, the base. Um, the base of the Liberal Party, they keep telling us, is the business community. The business community are crying out for certainty. Yes. And when you talk about how broad it is, uh, they had, we tried, went through all the schemes, the emissions intensity scheme, uh, the clean energy target, then the NEG. We we're prepared to cooperate on anything just to get that certainty through. And you mentioned uh, Bob Catter. Um, you'd be surprised. Someone like Bob Catter understands that the largest renewables being built anywhere in Australia are in his electorate. Big Kennedy, small Kennedy, two big wind projects. Kidston, a solar project uh, with uh, connecting into the grid. They understand that jobs in the future are about renewables. It's only, it's only this rump oh. holding back Quick, quick, quick question. The whole of the parliament. No confidence motion uh, on climate change action? Well, we'll deal with things on its merits, but it was Scott Morrison who said last week that uh, this would create more uncertainty if Karen Phelps, if an independent, held and they were, they were reduced to being a minority government. That was what he said, and he said it would be uncertain, not just politically, but uncertain for the economy. So on, on his reckoning uh, of what he said last week, if he took that to its logical conclusion, he'd go visit Yarra Lumla sometime this week. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Philip Ruddick, I think the other thing, can I just yeah, yeah, make, a, make a point, that I think that the government and, and these commentators are doing people a great disservice to make this argument that only rich people care about climate change. I think it's really insulting to say mm. that uh, because somebody doesn't, you know, lives in the western suburbs and they might have trouble paying their electricity bills, that they're not worried about the future of the planet. I mean, that's a completely nonsensical uh, uh, way of, of putting it. And the way in which, the, as Peter pointed out, the government has conflated the issue of climate change and, and electric um, power bills mm. is, is not only inaccurate and is, you know, is a result of failed policy in the past on their part, but it's, it's a, it's a dodo-like approach to refusing to deal with what is one of the, you know, the greatest uh, ch challenges of our time. I mean, I, it's now 12 years since I stopped being the president of uh, International Greenpeace and I was in that job for six years. And during that time, there were a number of IPCC reports about um, warning us about specific measures and, and, and measures of what was likely to happen. And each of those reports was pretty dire. Uh, that was 12 years ago. Since then, the reporting from the IPCC has become even more dire. The situation is much worse. There's been so much mm -hmm. tangible evidence of damage being done before our very eyes by changes to climate. And yet we have a government that is refusing to either acknowledge that or do anything about it. And it's I, absolutely I, I, derelict. I've got to go to... Well, I think I'd better to... try and turn this into a debate if I can. Um, let me just say that I'm not a climate sceptic. Um, but I do believe that if Australia is to play its part, it ought to be playing with the world that is acting on it. And I have a very, very significant you issue. You mean you should definitely stay with the Paris Agreement? Absolutely. You've got to be part of what the world community is doing. It's not going to be resolved by Australia with about 1% of emissions dealing with it if you've not got China, if you've not got Europe, if you've not got India, you've not got the United States, you've not got South America, all involved. Um, and if we get involved doing the only things that are going to try and influence it, our economy will be significantly I wasn't disadvantaged. That. I wasn't significantly that. disadvantaged. So my view has always been we've got to play our part, but we have to recognise that we've got to bring the world with us. And if we can't bring them with us, we can't be in front, and we shouldn't be behind. Okay, was we're there, way behind. Was there was I there was there a message behind. that your government got from the Wentworth by-election, or were they just too posh? to really reflect what Australia thinks? Look, I don't think people make reflections upon electors in that way, Tony. I mean, the fact is that these issues are live issues. They need to be talked about, talked about realistically, so that we put in place sensible solutions to dealing with the matters that are before us. Like the NEG? 
I believe that you have to be very conscious of the fact that there have been very, very significant impacts upon people's household electricity bills, and that is around Australia, um, and people are very conscious. I was just saying that the mm. NEG was your solution, and then it wasn't your solution. Well, the, the NEG was an issue that uh, was being pursued in a particular way, um, and uh, no doubt the emphasis is still on maintaining realistic power prices. But with respect, Philip, the NEG went through your party room, not once but twice, and now you have no energy policy. Mm. No. We, we also had to get all of the states and the Labor Party up, and I don't think that had been secured either. Well, uh, the fact is that the Labor state certainly would do want action on climate okay. change and are taking action. OK, we're gonna, we've got time for only a couple more questions. We've got so many. Uh, the next question is from Maya Avramovich. Avramovic. Thanks, Tony. Um, how low can we really go in Australian politics when we have um, the latest known dirty trick is to publish a fake email falsely claiming that high-profile Dr Karen Phelps has HIV? Um, and what does this say about politics in general? Start with Peter Van Onselen. Look, it doesn't say much uh, for the author of it, whoever it was, but... This, this, look, this, this goes on in campaigns, uh, believe it or not. Uh, it wasn't, from what we can tell, affiliated uh, with any mainstream party or, or individuals. Uh, it was shocking for Karen to have to go through that. Uh, this happens unusually in a seat like Wentworth, but unfortunately more commonly in key marginal battlegrounds where you have these sort of rogue elements, but that doesn't in any way, shape or form justify it. It's, it's outside the mainstream of politics and anyone doing that within the mainstream would be immediately acted against uh, by all political parties. That's, Peter, that's you, the... you've seen the, uh, the Australians reporting on this today and Mr Sharma is pointing his finger at the ABC's <laughs> reporting and saying they only released part of the email. So part of the email about the HIV claim, yes. but not the section of the email which dealt with Sharma himself and which appeared to be a racist attack on him. That's his view. Yes, look, I've read the email and I've read the ABC's response. Uh, look, I can understand uh, why Mr Sharma is upset because at one level there were attacks on him as well. And in an ideal world, I think the ABC probably in the digital age we're in should have just put the email online. But the lead in the story was definitely about Karen Phelps because the, there was a, a slur at Dave Sharma on the way through, but the essence of the email was unquestionably to slur Karen Phelps and to urge people to vote for Dave Sharma. So I think the ABC story was the right story. Uh, I just think, you know, if you're going to be critical in hindsight, perhaps they should have just whacked the email up on the website to avoid any form of criticism. Karen. I have reported this email to the Australian Electoral Commission and to the Australian Federal Police and we're looking at what other authorities we might need to report it to. And I did it because I don't want this to be a feature of any future campaigns. And I think if there is a signal that is sent out that this is something that if you try it on, that you'll be caught out and you'll be punished, then that's what I would like to achieve out of this. But the other thing that I wanted to achieve out of this was to, to take this and say it is... Uh, it, it is a long road that we still have to go to destigmatise HIV. Because for someone to think it's a slur, for someone to think it's an insult to say that somebody has been uh, diagnosed with, with this infection, HIV, tells me that even though we've come so far, we still have a long way to go. Because people living with HIV are living happy, productive and healthy lives now uh, because of the advances that we've made uh, in medical treatment and in social support. And Australia has been an incredible leader in this area. So I'm, I'm actually a patron of uh, ACON's Pride in Health and Wellbeing program. And, uh, and I would like to see some funding for a, a whole new education program around the stigma of HIV to come out of this. Now, Karen Phillips, you gave the email to the ABC, so you would have seen the full email, which Dave Sharma says contained vile and despicable slurs against him. Do you agree with that, his assessment of it? Because uh, just to give you one example, it said, the full email, Dave Sharma belongs to Brahman. Only electing Dave Sharma into office can we make sure Australia will continue to open its doors to Indian migrants who are better than the convict's offspring. Now, he's taken that as a sort of racist slur. Uh, what do you think? 
Look, I, I just think that the whole email uh, was was offensive uh, in, in many ways. It, it was telling people not to vote for me and to vote for somebody else. And so it, was, it, was, it wasn't exa exactly designed to help my campaign. Was, it, was but... it more likely, though, to be the product of a diseased mind, not a dirty trick from some political party or political players? I said during the campaign that I did not believe that this was the work of any of the political parties and that it was most likely the work of an individual. Uh, although it is hard to tell because it seemed to be a very systematic distribution of this email. Uh, and that's why I've reported it, so that the appropriate author authorities can deal with it and so that I'm not uh, hypothesising about where it's come from or, or who sent it. Quick one from Philip Reddick on this. Well, I, I, it's a unity ticket. I mean, it is totally mm. unacceptable. Mm. Um, I regard it as unacceptable. Um, I have experienced it at various times. My wife reminded me that the Epping pub was one place where they used to say something about my marriage every year that we had an election. Um, it was one of the things that, you know, does happen in election campaigns, but it is totally unacceptable. I hope the police are able to identify who was responsible uh, because I worry enormously about what goes out on this electronic media these days and the way in which it can be used. OK, we've got time for one last question. I'm told it's from Louisa Lowe. My question's for Anne Summers. Um, you've witnessed an enormous amount of change for women um, during your lifetime, which you talk about in your recent book. Um, recently, we've had some wins, such as um, Queensland decriminalising abortion and um, Karen Phelps nearly being elected to Wentworth, <laughs> hopefully soon. Um, but so far this year, 55 women have been killed by domestic violence. Mm. What do we still need to do and what's next? Yeah. Um, well, specifically on domestic violence, which I agree is uh, uh, one of the most significant um, issues facing our country, not just for women, but for all of us. Um, and one of the things I report in my book is that when I worked for Paul Keating back in uh, 1992, before that last election, that, when that 93 election, we did some research asking women around Australia what they thought the most important issues were for women. And uh, the three issues that women themselves chose and the results were remarkably uniform all around the country, regional and city areas, were firstly um, childcare, secondly women's health and thirdly violence against women. And I remember being very shocked uh, to realise that violence uh, was so pervasive uh, in the way that, that it had been reported. And we found out uh, at, at that time that the research that the Liberal Party was doing was finding exactly the same results. So there was total uh, bipartisan agreement that these were important issues that we had to deal with. But we really didn't have a clue what to do. I mean, it, violence against women was not seen as being uh, within the purview of the federal government. You know, most of the laws related to, to the states. But So that was the beginning of, of the federal government trying to work out how it could respond. And so if you look, you know, 20 odd years later, what have we done? Well, we're throwing a lot of money at it, particularly in research, and uh, there's a huge amount of research going on, but I don't think we're coming up with any uh, real answers. I don't think we're really analysing the causes of this violence, and we're certainly not being effective in trying to stop it. And so I think we need to be, you know, taking a far more um, aggressive problem-solving approach to it, uh, in addition to the research that's already being done. And uh, we certainly have to be more vigilant when it comes to law enforcement. And uh, we have to be, uh, have an absolutely um, zero tolerance approach to violence of any kind, verbal, um, online harassment, stalking, and all the way in the spectrum up to these terrible murders that have been taking place. And I do think the uh, pervasiveness of violence, and I do think it's increasing, and I do think it is related to a lot of men resenting women having economic independence and having freedom, um, is something that we as a nation just have to deal with. Would, uh, would this be more, or would it be easier to deal with if there were more women in politics, more women well, I mean, it would, I think running the policy of the country, basically? Well, I cer certainly when there are more women in office, you see women's issues um, dealt with. Um, I mean, the, the result in Queensland, the decriminalisation of abortion in Queensland was due to the work of the women leaders uh, of, that, um, of that government, in particular the Labor government in Queensland, but also some of the, the women on the other side of politics. So there is 
ample evidence that when women are there in, in, in sufficient numbers in politics, I and mean, we saw this back with the RU486 debate, which is what, you know, nearly 20 years ago, I think, when that was, a cross, that was an effort by women from the four parties against the then health minister, Tony Abbott, who had banned the import of RU486, which is a non-surgical um, abortion uh, method. And uh, that ban was overturned as a result of the work done by those women. So I think uh, the more women we have in parliament, the better for all for representational let, reasons. Let's throw let's that to equity reasons, reasons, almost brings us also... back to where we were at the beginning of the program. So let's hear from... No, I, I, I have a view that we are seeing much more aberrant behaviour in our communities than ever. And a lot of it has to do with these drugs that are being used. And I spent some time on one of your other programs talking about these issues um, and why we ought to be very much focused in working with children uh, to get a very zero tolerant view in relation to those sorts of matters. We are finding um, in the Shire of Hornsby that there is much more violent criminal activity um, generated largely because of use of drugs. It worries me enormously. OK, let's just go back to the question about women in politics, though, which we were talking about at the beginning of the program. Would it, would it change the country significantly if, at least in the Liberal Party and in the major parties at least, there were 50-50 uh, representation in terms of gender? No, I want to see more women engaged and seeking out public office in a competitive system. But what about winning office? I would want them to win office too. We've got a marvellous woman Premier in this state uh, and uh, I support her very strongly and the party supports her very strongly. Uh, Peter. Well, I, I said it before, I, I think the Liberal Party, like it or not, is so far behind on the gender issue that it does need to look at quotas now. Uh, this idea that merit is what gets this mob in government there, lock stock, is ridiculous. You know, not, merit is in the eye of the beholder and if half the population are women, the notion that in the coalition they can have only 13 of now 75 seats held by women, if, you, if you're telling me that that's merit-based, I don't believe it. And if it's not merit-based, you've got to do something about it. If it is merit-based, it's very insulting to Liberal Party women. Absolutely. Well, and it's, it's clearly not merit-based uh, when you have a look at, at some of the blokes who are there. <laughs> <laughs> Simply as that. I think it's a pretty simple principle that we have a democracy. The democracy should reflect the population. What that means is 50-50 gender. What that means is diversity in other ways as well in terms of religion to reflect and uh, race and different backgrounds so that we reflect the community. That's a parliament that functions better. And, and Anne is absolutely right. Uh, the Labor Party culture in the time in which I've been in, in Parliament over the two decades, which has seen an increased number of women in senior positions, it has changed the internal culture. Like, it's front and centre. The gender impact of policies is discussed right across the board. Education, health, infrastructure, right across the board. Karen Phelps, I'll give you the final word. I believe that it's going to take quotas in the Liberal Party to shift that 13 to closer to equal representation. And if that's what it takes, then I believe that the Liberal Party has some soul searching to do and that they need to at least have a look at their pre-selection processes because clearly their pre-selection processes are not pre-selecting women on the basis of merit. Uh, it, it is possible that the uh, well-reported incidents of maltreatment of women within the Liberal Party, the bullying and the reports that we've had about the way women have been treated is uh, impeding a number of women of merit from standing for pre-selection. And so the culture within that party is going to need to be addressed as well. But, but I do think that we will get better representation of the community if we have greater diversity in the parliament. In other circumstances, would you have considered running as a candidate for the Liberal Party? No, it's important to me that I am an, an independent. I mean, I've considered over the years uh, running for, you know, for Parliament, but I've rejected it, number one, because uh, there's never been a time that it had felt right to run. But it also, uh, at every juncture, I was asked, well, you know, if this particular issue that you feel strongly came up, uh, uh, would you vote against it? Would you speak against it? And a marriage equality being an obvious example. And I had to say, you know, deal breaker for me. And so being an independent is the right fit and it seems like the right time for me to be doing this.
Well, thank you very much. That's all we have time for tonight. Please thank our panel, Anthony Albanese, Karen Phelps, and Summers, Philip Ruddick and Peter Van Onselen. Thank you very much. Next Monday, Q&A goes Shakespeare. We broadcast live from the pop-up Globe. On the panel, the leading lights of Australian theatre, internationally celebrated stage and screen director Neil Armfield. Playwright and rising star Nakia Louie. Actor, writer and director Toby Schmitz. Actor, musician and play school presenter Zinzi Okenyo. And Miles Gregory, the founder and director of the Pop-Up Globe, who conceived the idea of building a modern replica of Shakespeare's Globe Theatre that could travel the world. 400 years after Shakespeare's death, we're still finding new ways to stage his plays while binging through the golden age of television. So why are we so addicted to comedy and drama? Until next week, good night.